in future. And when we talk about scrambling in quantum information, there's another important keyword, which is decoupling. So please remember this name, decoupling. It's um, as important as scrambling in this talk. And actually, um, we do care about scrambling in quantum information because it's closely related to this decoupling approach. And by doing this approach, we can connect this, scramb this scrambling to quantum error correction. So in this talk, I will first overview this kind of um, topics, um, scrambling and decoupling and so on in quantum information science. And then I will explain the implica implications onto um, different um, fields of physics. So this is a plan of my talk. As I said, I will start with a brief introduction of um, scrambling and decoupling. And recently we generalized the decoupling approach and actually the talk is based on this generalization. And, but actually this generalization is a little bit technical. So I will just briefly mention how we generalized the decoupling. And based on this um, technical contribution, we um, apply this one to our first quantum error correction. And actually to be more precise, we provide a new capacity theorem, which we call hybrid capacity theorem. So I believe we have some contribution to quantum information theory. And then by using this capacity theorem, we argue um, some possible properties like quantum error correcting properties in quantum chaotic system. So the second part of my talk is uh, more or less related to quantum information and strongly correlated physics. And in the third part, last part of my talk, I also want to use this generalization to understand hyden preskill protocol with symmetry. Well, probably everybody knows, but hyden preskill protocol is a kind of quantum mechanical toy model of um, information paradox. So we could get some insight into this if we use this generalization. So this is my the third part of my talk. And I will conclude uh, my talk with summary. So actually, you know, um, my talk is composed of three different parts and uh, I try to mention each of, I mean, all of these fields. So I hope everybody um, can enjoy some part of my talk. Okay. So let's get started. So let me start with, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yes. So let me start with um, the, um, what we mean by scrambling. Well, when we say scrambling, we often mean it's a chaotic unitary dynamics. So intuitively speaking, it's a kind of uni uh, unitary dynamics in a quantum chaotic system. And we often expect that if um, scrambling is happening in the many body system, then the information which is initially localized um, in a tiny um, part of the many body system, you know, spread to the whole um, system so that we cannot um, access the information if we look at uh, the only local region of the system. So this kind of delocalization of the information is a kind of intuitive understanding of scrambling. And this is fine. I think we have all, we all have a consensus on at this point. But the point is that um, if we formulate the idea of scrambling um, in a formal manner, um, there are many different definitions depending on the situation. So for example, um, in quantum information, we often formulate scrambling by using hard random unitary or unitary T design. And the hard random unitary is a kind of, you know, uniformly distributed unitary uh, random unitary. So you have a unitary group and if the um, ensemble of unitary is distributed, distributed uniformly at random in the whole unitary group, we call it hard random unitary. So this is a bit mathematical definition, but you can think of this as a kind of generic unitary in some sense. And the unitary two design or actually unitary T design in general is just an approximation of a hard random unitary. So in quantum information, we often use these two concepts to um, exactly uh, define or formulate scrambling dynamics. On the other hand, uh, for example, uh, in other fields like a fundamental physics and strongly correlated physics. I think it, it is more common to use out of time ordered correlators to define scrambling. So out of time ordered correlator or TOC is just a very strange um, um, correlation function at a different time. 
So actually, it's very hard to measure, I think. But um, if this OTOC sufficiently decreases after some time, then we expect that the dynamics is sufficiently scrambling. So there is a definition. I think in this field, the definition of scrambling is defined by the decay of OTOC. And of course, some people use operator entanglement, operator growth. So there are many different notions of scrambling in you know, depending on the situation uh, we are interested. But in this talk, I'm from quantum information. So I would like to um, define this scrambling in this talk by using this concept, unitary two design. But of course, I don't want to um, bother you by this jargon, unitary two design. So uh, I would mention the result by this. So actually unitary two design is a little bit stronger notion of scrambling uh, than that um, the scrambling based on OTOC. So uh, here I just mentioned, uh, want to emphasize that when I say scrambling in this talk, that means that is a strong, a little bit stronger version of scrambling than OTOC. But if you don't want to be bothered by this kind of um, subtlety, uh, you can just think of scrambling uh, like an OTOC sense. Okay. So having said that, um, Wait, mm -hmm. what happened? Yeah, okay. So having said that, um, next I would like to explain why we care about scrambling in quantum information. And as I said in the uh, first uh, slide, um, the reason is scrambling is related to the very important task in quantum information theory known as decoupling. So in this slide, I'm gonna explain what is decoupling. This is really important in quantum information. So here is a task of decoupling. Actually, it's very simple. So let's say we have a quantum state, psi SR. So this is a bipartite state between two, uh, two systems, S and R. And um, this state is given. And uh, we consider the situation that um, we apply some unitary operation on the one of the system, S. Okay? And after that, we apply a given CPTP map. This is also given. And finally, we have some quantum state. And the goal of decoupling is to find a good unitary such that the resulting state um, is a close to a product state. So if this state is close to some product state, then we say, um, yeah, the state is decoupled. You know, product state is kind of decoupled. So we call this task decoupling. And actually we are very interested in this decoupling task because if we find such a good unitary U, roughly speaking, we can use the same unitary to encode quantum information in a very good manner. So this is a little bit informal expression, but um, this decoupling task is re um, related to the um, encoding of information. And that's why we are very interested in this decoupling. And what is important to us in this talk is that so if we, we choose this unitary as a scrambling dynamics, we can typically achieve this task of decoupling. Well, of course, we have to assume some uh, conditions, entropic conditions on this uh, uh, initial state and the CPTP map. But if that condition is satisfied, you know, scrambling dynamics achieves decoupling. And as I said, decoupling is um, related to the encoder of information. So if we have a screen, but scrambling dynamics, then intuitively speaking, we can use that for um, encoding quantum information. So this is a kind of landscape uh, in quantum information. Stumbling, decoupling, they are also related to uh, kind of encoding of information. So here's just a brief history of decoupling. I think it's um, good to mention some literature. Um, the decoupling approach, well, as far as I know, decoupling approach uh, was first um, proposed by Debitak and Winter in early 2000s. And uh, since then, lots of people uh, developed uh, the, this decoupling approach. And one of the important theorem is called uh, the so-called one-shot decoupling theorem. And both of them, I mean, all of these procedures are based on scrambling. And based on this kind of technolog technological um, development, you know, um, people used this approach 
to get some insight into quantum error correction, or to be more precise, and they proved lots of capacity theorems. So they have, you know, the coupling approach has a very good um, um, consequences or implications in quantum information. Also, uh, many people um, actually explored to use this decoupling approach to understand uh, many body systems, such as um, quantum thermodynamics and also black hole information paradox. So I would say this decoupling approach is uh, important, not only in quantum information, but also um, to understand um, the quantum information in many body systems, such as like uh, strongly correlated physics and also fundamental physics. So I would be happy if you know you are interested in scrambling, you know, you should also kind of you know interested in the coupling. So then you can get lots of insight about quantum information in many body systems. And that's why you know I think it's kind of nice to further explore the potential use of the coupling in many body physics. And this is a kind of motivation of our recent progress. Yes, and uh, in two or three years ago, maybe two years ago, yeah, um, we generalized the partial, uh, sorry, the coupling approach to the kind of new version, which we call partial decoupling approach. And actually this um, partial decoupling theorem and so on, depends on the special type of scrambling, which we'll uh, see uh, in soon. I'm not gonna explain this uh, partial decoupling theorem because it's a little bit technical, but um, I'll just give you uh, some idea of what we mean by partial decoupling. So in this partial decoupling, we consider exactly the same situation um, as decoupling, except one thing. So in the decoupling approach, we apply arbitrary unitary or we often apply scrambling dynamics, right? But when we talk about partial decoupling, we assume that this unitary should have this um, direct sum structure. And this UJ is chosen as a scrambling in a subspace. So this is a difference between decoupling and partial decoupling. In the case of decoupling, you know, we just scramble all the Hilbert space by applying a very random unitary. On the other hand, um, when we talk about partial decoupling, you know, the unitary has a kind of, you know, tensor block diagonal structure and each block just, you know, scrambles subspace of the Hilbert space. So this is a kind of situation what we consider in this partial decoupling approach. Probably you would, would like to ask, why do we care about this um, direct sum structure of the unitary dynamics? But as we will see, it's useful. For example, um, by using partial decoupling theorem, uh, we can obtain a new capacity theorem. So there is some contribution to quantum information theory. And based on this capacity theorem, as I said, we can argue some interesting property in quantum chaos. And also we can use this partial decoupling theorem to investigate um, Hayden Presco protocol with symmetry. And actually we can find uh, some relation to the thermodynamics of the system. So it's also interesting, um, I think. So um, yeah, so based, and based on this partial decoupling things, we can say you know, lots of things to quantum information science and other fields of um, uh, physics as well. So at the high level, main message in this talk is I would like to propose a partial decoupling uh, um, approach as a new tool to study quantum information in many body systems. And especially this is very um, useful if um, the many body system has some symmetry. So this is a kind of main, very abstract message of this talk. And in the rest of talk, um, in the second part, I will focus on these things, quantum error correction or capacity theorem and quantum error correction in quantum chaos. And then uh, I change the topics to the uh, Hayden Presque um, protocol with symmetry. So this is, um, I will talk in the last part of my talk. Okay, so this is a structure of uh, my talk, the end of the introduction. So from now on, uh, let me focus on quantum error correction and capacity theorem. And I will explain how we use scrambling in this context. Oh, somebody raised hand? Oh, yes. 
Uh, can I ask you a question about decoupling? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, when the uh, SN are uh, maximally entangled, right? Mm -hmm. it seems that the local unitary can be cannot uh, decouple. Oh, um, actually, it depends on the CPTP map. And you are right. If this is maximally entangled, it's very hard to achieve this task. Mm -hmm. But if this CPTP map is okay, the trivial case is you know if you erase almost all qubits by this CPTP map. Maybe it's possible to achieve the coupling. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it highly depends on how much this is entangled and how strong this CPTP map is. And even in the case, uh, if U is scrambling, then you can achieve the coupling? Um, actually, the condition uh, for the decoupling to be achieved is given by some condition depending on this initial state and uh, this CPTP map. And if that condition is satisfied, then we can decouple, we can achieve decoupling by scrambling dynamics. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a nice question. Um, sorry, maybe a quick follow up on this. So, this psi r that you have there, is, that, uh, is there any obvious relation to the psi sr on the left? Is it just a partial trace? Oh, or? this one? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is a partial trace of this one. Okay. And, but uh, this row a can be any state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's continue. Oh, yes. So, um, yeah, uh, for the time being, we focus on quantum error correction. And let me give you one just slide um, to briefly explain what is quantum error correction. So, um, quantum error correction, which I abbreviate by QEC for short, um, is a method to protect information from quantum noises. So here is a just a um, very stupid uh, cartoon of quantum error correction. So let's say we have a quantum system and we assume that this system is uh, a little bit noisy. So we have some noisy map here. So if we don't do anything um, it, in the end, end of the day, we have a noisy quantum system. But the purpose of quantum error correction is to avoid this situation by exploiting um, encoding and decoding maps. So the goal, mathematically speaking, the goal is to achieve this um, identity. I mean, applying encoding map, noisy map, and decoding map should be close to the identity map. So we want to find such encoding and decoding. So in this cartoon, um, this is just very high um, explanation, high level explanation, but we just add two boxes, two maps before and after the noise. And uh, we want to effectively cancel this noise. And so the uh, system remains noiseless. Um, yeah, if, yeah, so this is a kind of situation, I mean, goal of quantum error correction. And of course, quantum error correction is very important in quantum information, and uh, it's a, it has a long history. And I would say um, there are two approaches in the study of QEC. One, I would say practical approach and the other is a fundamental approach. Well, these approaches, I mean, these names are not so standard, but I think this is, makes sense. So um, in the practical approach of um, QEC, the goal is to explicitly construct encoding and decoding operation. So for example, I think everybody knows toric code, you know, toric code, color code, and also happy code, repetition code. You know, if we have these code, we know how to encode and how to decode information. So I would say, you know, these approaches to the QEC is a kind of practical one. Because, you know, if we know how to encode and decode information, we can practically use that um, quantum error correcting scheme. So this I call, so that's why I call this a practical approach. And of course, this is important because in reality, we want to use quantum error correction. So we have to know how to encode and decode. But also this approach is interesting because um, in some cases, um, these quantum error correcting codes provide an um, interesting um, toy model to understand physical phenomena. For example, toric code and color codes, I believe they are used to understand topological orders. And also happy code, this is first proposed as a toy model of uh, the ADS CFT correspondence. So even though they might be just a toy model, you know, this practical approach is somehow related to um, physics. 
So it's very important, but I'm not going to explain this practical approach in this talk, and rather I would like to focus on the fundamental approach to QEG. And the question is to find the fundamental limit of QEG in this approach. So for example, if the noise is too strong, you can guess that it's very hard to effectively cancel such a hard, uh, strong noise, right? So there should be some limitation of QEG. So the uh, fundamental approach is interested in such a fundamental limit. And more precisely, we want to know how much information can be in principle protected from a given noise n. So to answer this question is the goal of this fundamental approach. And scrambling actually comes into the play if we are interested in this fundamental limit. So from the next slide, I will explain how we use scrambling in this uh, fundamental approach to explore the fundamental limit. Okay, um, and, uh, yeah, at this point, I have to be a little bit more quantitative. So let me explain the quantitative setting of QEC. So here is again, the same cartoon as a, um, for the QEC. But actually we can think of many different situations of um, QEC. For example, the information to be protected can be classical information or can be quantum information, right? Maybe you think it's a little bit nonsense to um, protect classical information in the quantum system, because if we, it's just a classical information, we can store it in the hard disk, but as a theory, we can think of this situation. We want to um, protect classical information in a uh, quantum system. So in this talk, uh, yes, um, I assume that we want to um, protect C-bit classical information and Q-qubit quantum information into the, some quantum system. So this is the first uh, uh, kind of situation, uh, you know, depending on what information to be protected, we can you know, think of different situations uh, scenarios. And also the situation changes depending on whether the additional resource such as entanglement is available or not. Probably all of us know that um, if we have an entanglement, we can perform, for example, um, quantum teleportation or super dense coding, et cetera, et cetera. So entanglement um, typically uh, helps us for doing some um, information processing. So if we add entanglement, we could do more in QEC. So uh, in this talk, I assume that we are allowed to use EE bits during encoding and decoding operation. Okay. So now we have three quantities, CQ and E, and what we are interested in the recovery error delta. Well, of course, you know, it's very hard to perfectly cancel the noise. So, so when we talk about quantum error correction, we always care about recovery error. And if this error is very small, we are satisfied. And the question in the fundamental uh, limit, I mean, sorry, fundamental approach of QEC is what is the trade-off relation between CQE and delta? You can imagine there should be a trade-off, right? Because if, uh, for example, C or Q are very large, then, you know, delta should be also large. You know, it's very difficult to protect lots of information, right? So there should be some trade-off relation. And we want to know the optimal trade-off relation between these four quantities. Okay, so here's a brief uh, kind of uh, the literature, like a history of this trade-off relation. Of course, you know, many people were interested in this trade of relations and uh, there are lots of literatures over like 30 years, for example. And uh, yeah, I think I will skip uh, all of these, but um, yeah, for special cases, um, we know lots of trade of relations. They are very famous HSW theorem, LSD theorem, and so on. But actually um, the general case where all CQE are non-zero and uh, finite. In this case, um, it remains unexplored for some time. And this is what we have done based on the partial decoupling theorem. So uh, actually by using this partial decoupling approach, we proved the uh, trade of relation for this general case, which we call hybrid capacity theorem. And uh, yeah, 
So uh, from the next uh, slide, I will explain what is the hybrid capacity theorem and how we have obtained and how scrambling is used in this capacity theorem. Good. So um, again, uh, our interest is to find a trade-off relation between CQE and Delta. So here uh, we have a situation, we have C bits to be protected, Q qubits as well. We have additional resource of E bits and we have some noise operator. And to obtain the trade-off relation, the first step is we just assume the uh, specific encoding scheme where we use scrambling as we will see. So in this specific encoding scheme, we first apply basically just a random permutation onto the, uh, this classical bit. So this is just classical processing. We just uh, randomly permute um, this C bit. And then we attach ancillary qubits. And finally, we apply scrambling dynamics onto all of these uh, Q plus M plus E qubits. And we assume that this scrambling dynamics is conditioned by this uh, the classical information of this permutation sigma j. That means if we know this um, permutation, the value, we know what scrambling has happened in the system. And finally, we apply some extra map f. So this also might in general depend on this uh, sigma j. So we call all of this procedure an encoding scheme. Okay. Of course, this is just one encoding scheme, very special encoding scheme. But if we use this encoding scheme, we can show, well, we obtain a very good statement about the trade-off as we will see in the next slide. But note that the key point is actually this scrambling. <clears throat> okay, so uh, here we have uh, the special encoding scheme. And uh, um, actually, you know, in general, we have to construct a decoding operation in, to, to investigate this trade-off relation. But what is important in uh, decoupling approach is that without explicitly constructing, constructing this decoding, we can prove something about this trade-off relation. And especially if we use partial decoupling theorem, we can prove this. So uh, if we use this special encoding, then there exists a decoding map such that the recovery error delta is bounded from above by this quantity. So essentially, there are two terms, delta one and delta two. And delta one is given by this, and delta two is given by this. So here, like uh, we have C, Q, and E, you know, they are just initial configuration. And we also have some uh, um, entropy. And actually, this is a conditional entropy. You can forget about this max. I don't want to explain it. But um, this is basically the conditional entropy of some state rho n. And this row n can be constructed from this noise and this additional map, okay? So if you know the noise and if you know what you have applied um, in addition to the scrambling, then you can compute the uh, conditional entropies obtain and obtain delta one and delta two. So that provides an upper bound of the recovery error. So this is the first statement in the hybrid capacity theorem. But of course, this error might not be uh, the best one, right? Because we have considered only one uh, encoding scheme. But what is interesting, and actually this is typically the case in the coupling approach, we can also show that this encoding is optimal. So no other encoding scheme can do significantly better than this um, specific encoding. So by from these two statements, actually we can conclude that. So, um, C-bit classical information and Q qubit quantum information can be protected from a given noise n if and only if these two inequalities are satisfied. So this is a little bit informal statement, um, but I think this is precise enough for physics people. And uh, these two inequalities provide some kind of trade-off relation. For example, the second one is uh, the relation for quantum information only. Right? And if we have entanglement, of course, you know, the upper bound becomes higher. So entanglement helps. And we have also have a conditional entropy and actually F, you know, this additional map is just um, the arbitrary, you can choose arbitrary. So we have an optimization over F. 
and that provides a kind of upper bound of the quantum information to be protected. And the first one provides a trade-off between classical information and quantum information. So um, this is kind of the, um, the, yeah, that we call what we call hybrid capacity theorem. This provides a fundamental limit of um, sending information, sorry, storing information. Well, you may think this is a little bit technical, especially if you are not interested in quantum information theory, but we can learn two lessons, very high level lessons. So for example, one lesson we can learn is that the fundamental limit is actually characterized by conditional entropy of these states. So that's why, in general, conditional entropy is important in quantum information. And the re second lesson is that um, if we encode by random permutation, scrambling, and additional map, this is optimal. So actually, you know, scrambling is very important. Okay, um, I think, yeah, I can have a um, question. Yeah, yeah. I'm coming to your statement that there could be no scheme to significantly uh, that would be significantly better um, in terms of errors than, than what you've proven here. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, so you mean the scaling of... Uh, of oh, scaling, any? yes. Yeah. Yeah, just the scaling, but... Uh, yes. Okay, I see. So actually, to be more precise, we have to take some limit. Then, you yeah. know, this statement becomes uh, more clear, but I don't want to take the limit in this talk. So mm -hmm. I just skipped. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, next, Morrison, please. Uh, in the inequality you showed in, at last, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, here uh, is J, it's just a number. Oh, yeah, yeah J, I didn't explain actually. <laughs> uh, so, here um, in this random permutation, actually, we first embed the classical alphabet. You know, this is C bit, so J should be between one up to two to the C, but we embed this one to the uh, some larger kind of bit. So, J is greater than two to the C. Oh, so J cannot be arbitrary. They, J, you can choose, you can choose. But actually if J changes, actually this quantity also changes. So there's a kind of trade-off. I see. And, yeah. and also, uh, when does this inequality saturate? When? When? Well, um, we can choose because this is a purpose, right? So the statement is uh, we can um, um, protect information as much as much information. Sorry, how can I say? As far as this inequality is satisfied, you know, uh, we can protect the, the corresponding information. So we just, you know, this, so this is just an upper bound. So if you want to protect lots of information, you just put uh, um, lots of information up to this quantity. Oh, I see. I yeah. see. Thank you. Thanks. And also, I think I saw one more. Yeah, actually, I had the same question. Yeah, ah, I okay. wanted to ask about the meaning of this. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. OK, so, um, so, so far, this is a little bit technical, you may think. But actually, um, by using this theorem, we can study, we can argue some quantum correction property in quantum chaos. So that is a topic in the next part of my talk. So I will finish the quantum information part. Yep. Okay, so, um, well, this is more like um, maybe a little bit controversial, but I would like to propose a thought experiment that is somehow uh, related to, I mean, somehow useful to investigate quantum error correcting property in quantum chaos. So let me explain what is a thought experiment. So um, this is a very simple experiment, sort of experiment. Let's say we have uh, like a, a, a many body system of n qubits. And uh, we assume that this many body system is uh, sufficiently chaotic. And uh, what we consider is um, to encode some information into the part of this uh, many body system. So let's say the initial, um, initially this, these Q qubits have some quantum information. So we encode some quantum uh, state into a part of the system. And we also assume that uh, we, you know, this system is uh, more or less um, I mean, entangled with the qubits outside of the system. So we assume that we have EE e bits between these. Well, this is just for making the story interesting. And if you don't like this entanglement, you can just set E is zero. And the rest, we set the rest of the qubits as an arbitrary pure state, up or down or something like that. Okay. 
So this is the initial configuration. And then we switch on the chaotic and Hamiltonian, uh, Hamiltonian interaction in this many body system. And as I said, we assume that the Hamiltonian or the system is chaotic enough. So we just assume that scrambling dynamics occurs on the, this many body system. So actually, you know, when I say chaotic, I just mean the dynamics is scrambling. So it's a kind of cheating actually. But anyway, scrambling happens onto these qubits. And then some noise, we assume uh, some noise occurs, which might be a thermal noise, or maybe we just access uh, only a part of the many body system. So that is also a noise. So noise is applied. And finally, uh, we try to recover the original information from this noisy many body system. And uh, we are interested in the recovery error to recover this original information. So this is a thought experiment. And of course, if delta is sufficiently small, that means by definition, uh, we can actually um, recover this original information from the noisy many body system. And this should be merely due to the internal scrambling dynamics, right? Because except this noise, you know, only scrambling dynamics happened in the system. And of course, this scrambling dynamics is just kind of spontaneous time evolution by the Hamiltonian. So, um, if delta is uh, sufficiently small, maybe we could conclude that spontaneous QEC uh, is happening in the quantum chaotic system. So even if you know uh, the system is noisy due to the thermal noise or something, you know the original information of the system is actually stored because of this internal uh, scrambling dynamics. So this is the purpose why I um, just may propose this um, um, toy model and get a thought experiment. But if you think a little bit, then actually this situation is just a special case of the uncapacity theorem I mentioned, right? So here I just wrote um, the um, encoding scheme that we have used in the proof of capacity theorem, where we have random permutation, scrambling, and additional map. But um, in this situation, we just set C is zero so we don't have a classical information to be encoded, encoded, so no random permutation in this case. And we also set this additional map, map as an identity, and we have this uh, diagram, right? So uh, actually by using this theorem as a direct corollary, we can investigate this thought experiment. And as a result, we can obtain an upper bound of the recovery error, which is characterized again by the conditional entropy. But this conditional entropy is for the very simple state, this one. So we have a maximal entangled state and uh, we go through this maximal, a part of this maximal entangled state to the noise. I mean, noise is given, right? And we have this uh, state. And by computing the conditional entropy of this state, we know how much we can achieve, uh, uh, or, well, how much, uh, yeah, um, how much the AR can be small. Okay, so this is just a, I mean, very trivial application of our um, capacity theorem, but I think this formula is useful to study quantum error correction property of quantum chaos. And of course, I want to mention that, um, yeah, so this, uh, um, this bound is not necessarily tight, right? Because in the capacity theorem, we had an additional map of F, but in this case, there is no additional map F. So this bound might not be not optimal, might not be optimal. However, we did some new max. This is still a preliminary result, but it seems that if the noise is a local noise, which I believe uh, is the case in this uh, many body system, but if the noise is local, then it seems that this encoding scheme only by scrambling, I mean, spontaneous scrambling seems to be close to optimal. So this is a kind of interesting observation because if this is true, I mean, again, um, I just uh, I'll say it again, if, you know, do, because of the scrambling dynamics on the chaotic system, you know, the information is actually protected from local noises, right? So if this is the case, we don't have any proof of this. We just have a few numerics, but if this is the case, uh, we could conclude that um, spontaneous QEC might be intrinsic in quantum chaos. So this is our prospect and uh, we are still working on this. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I just want to share some idea 
And I just want to emphasize that by doing this kind of method, we could um, support and we could investigate this statement. Okay, so this is what I meant by QEC in quantum chaos. And uh, maybe if you have uh, some question, it's a good time to have some questions. No? Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course, please. Um, maybe I missed, but uh, did, did you define the local noise? How, how it, yeah, I can imagine like, uh, what do you mean by local noise? Oh, it's yes. like a measurement of uh, local spin or something like that, but uh, right. um, can, can you uh, make it a bit more precise? Or? Yeah, yeah, yes. So actually we did only some numerics, okay? And uh, the, the, in the numerics, we used, I think three noises. And one is just uh, the amplitude damping noise in each qubit. And also the other one is a dephasing uh, noise, independent dephasing noise. And finally, we also introduce one, I mean, uh, what's that? Yes, yeah. So we introduce some environmental qubits and we assume that each you know, qubit in this system is interacting with the environmental qubit. So this of, of course introduced some noise into the system. And even in that case, uh, you know, this bound is quite good. So we just, yeah, tried three noises, mm -hmm. but all are local in the sense that the noise is just independent. I see, thank you. Thank you very much. And do we breathe? Um, so in all of these, oh, can you hear me to start with? Mm, sorry, can you say it can, again? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, so. Um, so in these cases, you're considering applying the unitary, or you have unitary dynamics followed by noise. Uh, yes, um, right, yeah. And I'm just wondering, I mean, in, in the real world, this is um, not so realistic, right? Um, uh, so mm -hmm. you're gonna have no, the unitary dynamics is also going to be noisy. Um, well, um, yes and no, I get the point. Um, mm. So I assume that this dynamics is just a, a unitary dynamics, I mean, Hamiltonian dynamics of the system. Mm. So, well, this should be really unitary, but the problem is actually that, you know, the noise doesn't wait, right? Yeah. I mean, so actually this is more like a, like a, a repetition, like a small time step of unitary time, time, Hamiltonian time evolution, and then the noise happens. And then after that, we again another uh, unitary uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, and then again noise comes, something like this, right? Yeah. But yeah, you were right, and uh, we didn't investigate that case. It's very hard actually. Okay. So this is a kind of um, very ideal situation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. It's a very nice question. You show us some breeds. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, thank you. So I wanted to ask about a uh, more concrete uh, protocol, what you do in this decoding. Uh, because So, mm -hmm. for example, I know about the Toric code in mm -hmm. which yes. uh, you would encode the quantum information as a Wils uh, the, the eigenvalue of Wilson loop, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And let's say you are doing, uh, you want to do the scrambling and protect even harder. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what do you do? What is the decoding scheme in that case? Yeah, Where thank you, you for a very good question that I cannot answer. Well, the point is that in our proof, we can show that there exists a decoding map, but we cannot effect efficiently construct the decoding. Okay. So we don't know much about decoding. But mm. one point is that uh, actually we can use the, some uh, map, pets, uh, which is called pets recovery map as a decoding operation. Mm -hmm. So if we use this pet recovery map, we can actually achieve this bound, well, very close to this bound. But the point mm -hmm. is that pet recovery map cannot be, well, well, we don't know if pet recovery map can be efficiently implemented or not. Mm -hmm. You mean uh, on actual devices? Right, yeah. Okay. So if we have n qubits, probably, or I don't know, nobody knows, uh, uh, the the uh, implementation for pet recovery map takes exponential of n or something. Uh huh. Uh, I see. Yeah. So uh, okay. yeah, as I said, you know, we don't oh, know much about yeah. decoding. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay. And I had another question about yep. this scrambling part, mm -hmm. specifically because uh, here in this bound of the error, you mm -hmm. are uh, kind of saying that the number of e, e bits mm -hmm. is going to give exponential suppression of the error. Yes. Yeah. Right. And but on the uh, on the other hand, more in a more uh, device hardware looking way, mm -hmm. I think uh, implementation of two designs or random unitary circuits are going to demand like maybe exponentially many number right. of gates. So there would be some trade off. Can you comment? On oh, that? yeah, yes. And um, so um, this is closely related to what I mean by scrambling. But actually, um, you know, as I said, you know, I mean two design by scrambling and uh, mm. two design can be efficiently implemented. So if you use at most N squared uh, number of gates, then we can implement the two design. So in that oh, sense, okay. you know, there's a trade-off, but you know, this demanding is not so much. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. So I think I'm already running out of time. Um, so let me just quite quickly go through this um, hide and rescue protocol with symmetry. Yeah. So, um, yes. So I think, um, yeah, many people um, know what is the hide and rescue toy model because most of you are experts of quantum uh, gravity and quantum black holes. But um, this is just a toy model. Hide and rescue toy model protocol is a quantum mechanical toy model of information paradox. And actually, you can think of this hide and rescue toy model as a special case of the thought experiment of QEC in quantum chaos. So just let me explain what is hide and rescue protocol. So here we have a black hole of n qubits. You shouldn't take this black hole in a literal sense because you know these are just a bunch of qubits. So this is a quantum mechanical system. And uh, we assume that this black hole corresponds to the kind of real black hole after the page time. So we have some past Hawking radiation outside of the black hole, which is maximally entangled between the uh, to the um, interior of the black hole. So this is a kind of fast situation. So this is very close to the previous thought experiment. And we do nearly the same. So we prepare some k qubit um, quantum state psi and throw it into the black hole. And again, we assume that um, this black hole goes through some scrambling dynamics on this n plus k qubit. And we have a new radiation. So uh, we assume that after this scrambling, um, L qubits of new radiation comes out from the black hole. And the task is, again, try to recover uh, the original information from these qubits. Okay. So this is a hide and rescue protocol. And uh, we want to know this recovery error. This should be, in general, a function of L, N, and also K, right? So we want to understand the relation between these four uh, things. And uh, this is proposed by Hayden and Prescu back in 2007. And they, pro uh, they proved uh, that you know, by using the coupling approach, the error is actually given by 2 to the um, K minus L. So L is the number of new radiation and K is an the size of the original um, quantum information. So um, if L is slightly greater than K, then delta can be much smaller than one, right? So that means um, K qubit information can be recovered from only a slightly more than K qubits of new radiation. So this is a conclusion by hiding and Prescu. And they argue that um, black holes cannot hide any information due to this scrambling dynamics. Well, this is a little bit, you know, sort of surprising maybe because um, no matter how large N is, you know, N does not come um, into the play in this um, upper bound, right? So even if N is 10 to the 23 or something, you know, we can just forget about that. And actually we can recover K qubit information from only K qubit of new radiation. So uh, they argue that, you know, black hole is a kind of information mirror. So this is a review of Hayden Prescale, but here I would like to introduce one more ingredient in this toy model. So what if this black hole system has some symmetry? I think at this point I need some excuse because uh, as you all know, 
quantum black hole has no global symmetry. But I would argue that, I don't know, this is just my opinion. I can't argue because I'm not an expert of quantum black hole, but probably the violation should be weak because you know, in the classical case of black hole, you know, it has some symmetry. So I believe, point, just please uh, figure it out, um, please make a comment if I'm wrong, but I hope this no um, global symmetry, I mean, violation of the uh, global symmetry is weak. And also, even if all global symmetry is uh, violated, maybe energy conservation is there. So I hope um, it still makes sense to study exact symmetry to understand this kind of situation better. But I should admit that these are just excuses. As I said, I'm not an expert of quantum black holes. Um, so maybe none of them uh, doesn't make sense. But actually, even if they doesn't make sense, I would say that hidden Presque protocol with symmetry is very interesting as a toy model because by introducing symmetry, we can actually find a very non-trivial relation between this information leakage problem and some dynamics of the, this black hole system. So in the rest of my talk, I would like to you know, briefly mention the, this relation between information leakage and some dynamics induced by the symmetry. Okay, so what is the consequence of the symmetry? Well, of course, if this um, black hole or this, the, if this system has a symmetry, then um, there should be a conserved quantity that should not be scrambled by the internal dynamics. Right? This is just a by definition of conserved quantity. So um, if there's a symmetry, you know, the scrambling dynamics, I mean, the dynamics of this black hole or this system should be in this direct sum form. Here, M is a, um, the conserved quantity. And uh, here, uh, for simplicity, we assume just abelian symmetry. So um, due to the symmetry, the dynamics should be a direct sum form, right? So this is a difference from the original hidden Presque uh, toy model. And because of this uh, uh, um, direct sum form of scrambling, you can use just partial decoupling theory. And actually, oh, sorry, just let it, uh, me make it, the situation clear. So uh, we, we consider the same situation as the original Hayden Presque toy model, but we assume that the dynamics is in this form. So the dynamics scrambles the, uh, the subspace with a fixed um, um, conserved quantity. And um, we ask what is the recovery error under this dynamics. Okay. So this is what we are going to um, think of. Yeah, and as I said, we have a direct sum form of scrambling. So uh, we can use partial decoupling and we obtain a very general formula for this error delta. Uh, oh, there's no delta, delta here. And I don't want to write this general formula because I have to explain some more um, technical details, but uh, by using this general formula, we can do some numerics and we obtain lots of figures. And actually this is uh, the uh, um, uh, figure for the recovery error versus the number of new radiation L. And uh, these you know, different figures corresponding to the different initial conditions and different lines also corresponds to a different uh, initial conditions of the system. But what I want to say is that, you know, this orange line, these orange lines, you know, this corresponds to the non-symmetric case. So the original hayden Preskill protocol. And you should look at only these plots. Then, you know, the error decreases quite differently uh, from the uh, non-symmetric case. And especially, perhaps you can guess, uh, you, can, you can see, uh, in some cases, you know, there's a kind of delay of the offset of information leakage. So in the case of non-symmetric case, you know, the, the recovery error decreases at this, from this point. But in this case, you know, we have to wait more, right? So there's a kind of delay of um, starting point of information leakage. And, we can also see another difference, which is an information remnant. I, I just call this information remnant. So in all cases, you know, the, info, the, the recovery error decreases quickly, right? But at some point it stops decreasing and it becomes a plateau. So we call this plateau information remnant. 
And all of these two uh, um, effects are just um, induced by the symmetry of the system. Oh, by the way, I think I didn't explain. Um, for simplicity, we assume that the symmetry is an axial symmetry. So the system has a, like a, uh, yeah, one axis, let's say Z axis, and uh, it's rotating around this axis. So the conserved quantity is a Z component of the angular momentum. But anyway, yeah, this is uh, almost the, the, the last slide. Um, so as I said, if the black hole, or if the system has a symmetry, so that the uh, scrambling is with symmetry, we have two substantial differences from the non-symmetric case. One is delay, the other is information remnant. And what is interesting is that if we investigate this delay more carefully, we can find that this delay is devised in, uh, divided into kind of trivial delay. So if you think uh, this part uh, from the information uh, theoretic point of view, we can understand this trivial delay easily. So that's why we call this trivial delay. And uh, the other part of the delay is, uh, it's kind of non-trivial delay. And the most interesting point in our analysis is that this non-trivial delay is actually fully determined by the thermodynamic properties of the black hole system. For example, if we know the thermal sensitivity of the conserved quantity or like a conjugate state function of the um, conserved quantity, we can compute this non-trivial non delay. So in this sense, I would like to say that uh, from our analysis, well, our analysis indicates some relation between how information leaks out from the black hole with symmetry and the thermodynamic pro property of the um, black hole system. So this is kind of interesting. And I think this is a more or less um, um, very surprising because some of you may think, you know, physics and information are kind of different. Information is an abstract stuff and physics is a kind of real stuff. But of course, you know, our uh, results suggest that it's not the case. So of course, information is physical. So if you know physics, then you should also know the information property of the system. So in this case, if you know the thermodynamics of the system, you can guess uh, how much delay would occur um, in the information leakage problem. So I think this, I like this uh, um, result. And about the information remnant, we can also do the similar analysis and uh, we can find that this information remnant is related to the symmetry breaking of the black hole. But I will skip this part and I would refer Yesterday, and there's a nice paper by um, Hiroyasu and, um, and Keiji. Um, they investigated this uh, information remnant kind of things in more general situation. And actually this is very strong. So if you're interested in this remnant kind of behavior, um, I would recommend you to look at this paper. But anyway, what I wanted to um, say in this um, part of my talk is that if we consider scrambling with symmetry, um, we can connect information leakage, like information kind of problem with the thermodynamics of the system. So we can connect information theory and physics. And that's why we think it's kind of interesting topic that if we address um, the unscrambling um, with symmetry. Okay, so I think I'm using the order one hour. So let me just conclude. Um, so this is a kind of landscape around the scrambling. It has lots of implications to quantum information, fundamental physics, and strongly correlated physics. What, and what we have basically done is we just generalized this decoupling approach to the partial one. And we use this partial decoupling approach to prove some capacity theorem. Some, uh, and we argue like quantum chaos and the hidden rescue protocol with symmetry. So there are lots of future problems, but uh, maybe you can read. Um, yeah, okay, let me mention just one thing. In this talk, I uh, mean by scrambling, just unitary tool design. But I'm really interested what happens if we really use the SYK model on dynamics instead of this unitary tool design, for example. So here we have SYK, which is also supposed to be very complex um, dynamics, but maybe, you know, Unitary two design is more stronger I and mean, more complex than SYK. And uh, our talk, this talk is always based on this. So what happens if the dynamics is SYK or like non-integrable or something like that? Can we say something about quantum error correction by using these things? This would be a very interesting future problem. 
and we could collaborate if you are interested. Okay, so that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you for your very interesting talk, Nakata-san. Oh, any question or comment from participants? Oh, Oshikawa-san, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. And uh, yeah, just a naive question. You know, I'm not expert on black hole, uh, less expert than you are. Um, but uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, this Ogri san's uh, famous result that, that there shouldn't be any symmetry, yeah, no global symmetry in the quantum black hole. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you know, I'm no expert, but uh, what I heard is that a black hole can be regarded as a fast scrambler and so on, so on. So, is there um, any prospect that uh, you can uh, realize uh, this uh, black hole with symmetry in some condensed matter system or something kind of emulation of your black hole with symmetry? Yeah, thank you very much for a good question. Um, I hope so, actually. So, for example, in condensed matter physics, um, so you know the uh, many body system often has lots of symmetries. So we could consider some very chaotic system, which also has some symmetry. So it's chaotic only in you know kind of under the assumption that symmetry is respected. So I think that it, this is kind of analogy to the uh, like symmetry protected topological order. Right? So um, if we consider such a, like a chaotic system with some symmetry, we can emulate all of this story. So yeah, yeah. does it make sense? You, yeah, you yeah. I, yeah, I kind of imagined like that, but uh, yeah. I just wanted to you know, confirm if you- are Yeah, yeah that is exactly what I'm also thinking. Mm. Yeah, because uh, for example, if you have some, I don't know, something like a random shape cavity or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, particle enters then you know it's bounced around the system randomly then it may act like a scrambler but uh, this uh, cavity generally conserves a number of particles then right yeah yeah, one, yeah one, yes. one, one possible, one possible example yes yeah. yeah thank you very much that's very nice um, question yeah great. thank you thank yeah you. thank you next ugajin san please uh, yeah, so so what do you, okay, in mind is this a rotating black hole, I mean, the scrambling for the rotating black hole. Right, yes, yeah. Um, okay, so I think the simplest, uh, this is just a comment, but the simplest example of this kind of rotating black hole is that uh, a black hole in three dimension, rotating, so-called rotating mm -hmm. BTD black hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so, so in that case, I think uh, you can, I mean, uh, directly compute this, I mean, the corresponding uh, OTOC in the boundary 2D. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the way, I mean, that the rotation modifies this, I mean, that the Lyapunov exponent mm -hmm. is that, uh, okay, so in CFT, in C uh, two-dimensional CFT, this left moving mode and the right moving modes are completely decoupled. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can define, I mean, that the temperature for each sectors. Okay. And, uh, okay, this rotating, okay, so when the black hole is not rotating, uh, the temperature of, it, of these, I mean, the two modes are the equal, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think rotation changes this I mean, slightly changes these temperatures, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, that modified temperature sh must, uh, should appear in this uh, OTOC. And uh, mm -hmm, probably mm -hmm. this is what you want to see from the information uh, theoretic. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for a good comment. And yeah, and if that is the case, you know the the Lyapunov exponent mm -hmm. uh, reflects some property of this rotation, right? And in that case, maybe it would be very interesting if we can connect that, you know, change of the of exponent with, uh, for example, delay or information remnant. And uh, I can imagine that would be very interesting. Um, yeah. Problem. Yeah. Actually, well, you know, I, I, I by myself cannot solve that problem because I don't know much about uh, CFT stuff. Uh -huh. If you are interested, yeah. let's let's uh -huh. do. That. <laughs> but but okay, one question is that this is not related to global symmetry. I mean, uh, not global internal symmetry. So, so I, I'm not sure. I mean, to what extent? I mean, that uh, this symmetry is suitable for your analysis. But uh, yeah, for, for um, sure you, we can. Yes. Yeah, for sure we can. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, this kind of direction is interesting. I think. Yeah. Um. So you mean that rotating symmetry? Yeah. Um, 
yeah. is not this, does not result in this form. No, uh, no, I'm just saying that. Okay, so so usually, I mean, the the, the way we distinguish global symmetry and uh, gauge symmetry is mm -hmm. that uh, right. Um, okay, so this and the rot rotation, I mean, correspond to the gauge symmetry and. Uh, so okay. It's not yeah, I think. Okay, so maybe I should think yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but we can talk later. Yeah, yeah thanks yeah, for yeah. a good comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, next, Numasawa-san, please. Yeah, my question may be similar to the Tomonori's question. But so, uh, so in yeah, yeah, I'm I'm also interested in this uh, scrambling with symmetry. But so, uh, is this symmetry a symmetry of some? Uh, CFT Hamiltonian, uh, assuming some ADS CFT correspondence, or uh, is this uh, some you uh, tried the modeling some bulk Hamiltonian? Um, uh, actually, you know, I, um, as you can see from this uh, uh, cartoon, you know, actually, I'm not actually considering the real black hole. So mm -hmm. if the system has any symmetry, like you can just think of any uh, quantum system with symmetry, then we can apply this uh, uh, situation. So I guess, mm -hmm. for example, the easiest way is uh, CFT with some symmetry. Does this make sense? If it makes sense, we can think of the uh, CFT with symmetry with this dynamics, and we can reproduce exactly the same uh, result as ours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah CFT can have some uh, many sim symmetry to n equal four super m is also have uh, symmetry. Mm -hmm. So, and in that case, so that corresponds to the bulk gauge symmetry. So. Mm -hmm. So that is allowed uh, from the Haro of its argument. So, yeah, yeah. so global so, symmetry is not allowed, but so gauge symmetry. I see. And, yeah. and that is the usual correspondence in ADS CFT. So if we have global symmetry in CFT side, then we have a gauge symmetry in mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. arc side. Mm -hmm. And also, so if we consider charged black, extremal charged, so near extremal charged black hole case, so there is a, a lot of, uh, in 4D case, so we have, uh, near extremal entropy. So that is zero temperature entropy. And I wonder whether that is related to this, uh, 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 yeah, this picture. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not pretty sure because I don't know what yeah. is the uh, extremal charged black hole you said? Yeah, near extremal case. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm not familiar with this um, extremal kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, um, if you let me know. Um, I there can... is a zero, zero temperature entropy. So, yeah. Oh, so I the ground that. state has entropy or something? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. okay, so can, can I just, uh, but uh, okay. Um, okay, so I, I, I saw one of the paper of Saskind and the company mm -hmm. where a uh, recent paper, I mean, and uh, um, okay, so they argued that the scrambling time for nearly extremal black hole. Uh, is I mean that uh, not I mean that the log of this black hole itself, but uh, I mean that the log of black hole black hole entropy minus I mean that the entropy of the extremal black hole, and uh, so maybe okay this is related to Tokiro's question. Um, could be sorry yeah. I, I, I yeah I I think uh, yeah I need more information yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but definitely yeah I think. It seems, you know, um, these days, many people started thinking about some kind of symmetry in this kind of scenario. So um, it would be nice if we can use this um, technique to investigate that um, near extremal th case or something. But um, yeah, it's a kind of future problem. And maybe we can discuss later. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I don't know much about that. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and, thank you very yeah, much. Uh, uh, another question is so, yeah, I'm also inter interested in the SYK side. So, for example, so we can also consider the uh, SYK with symmetry, like uh, uh, a complex SYK model, where in that case, so we have U1 symmetry. So, then, so can we test your some, uh, analysis with uh, mm -hmm. I think so, yes. I, I see, I see. Yeah, because SYK like should be uh, related to unitary two design. That is what <laughs> I meant by uh, scrambling. So if SYK has symmetry, then the same uh, situation as <laughs> I investigated. So I think that is definitely possible to use it. I see, I see. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, Morisan, please. Uh, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, in New setup, uh, you consider scrambling on n plus k qubits. Right. Uh, what are you, 
what happens if you, uh, there exists uh, another uh, other qubits uh, in the black hole, but uh, which is not observed. So uh, I mean, uh, the, you consider scrambling on n plus k plus some m qubits, mm -hmm. and that the way does this change your result? Um, not really. Um, sorry, what do you mean by um, m qubits? Because it sounds to me that you just change this n to n plus m. Um, but uh, uh, so how uh, the okay? So let me change uh, my question. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I'm uh, sorry. So, uh, the what 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 is the importance of n qubits? Which is uh, what what is the importance of uh, entanglement? Uh, of these oh. n qubits. Oh, uh, okay. Then I can uh, um, answer. So here I assume that uh, this is maximally entangled, but actually our analysis holds for any uh, um, um, any state between this black hole and uh, this past radiation. Oh, so the ma the the strength of entanglement uh, doesn't change your result. Uh, oh, sorry. The the result is uh, going to be changed. But uh, we can use the same uh, the uh, general formula for this error. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, yeah, that's actually a good point. So if the uh, entanglement is less, then you know this trivial delay becomes larger. I see. Yeah. So uh, yeah, what I want to say is uh, by using this formula, we can actually deal with a very general uh, um, state between black interior of the black hole and out um, exterior of the black hole. But of course, you know, the details would be changed depending on how much they are in, entangled. Is, is your setup can, can be applied for a mixed state? Uh, what, what I'm thinking is uh, if uh, the some part of uh, n qubits in the mm -hmm, black mm -hmm, hole- mm -hmm. uh, Yes, we can. Observe that, that is just traced out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the resulting state should be mixed state. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, in that case, we have to modify our uh, formula, but we can use, investigate that case in the same way. Uh-huh. Yeah. And how, so the, the general feature is the same? Um, so um, I, have never tried, but I guess uh, the error increases in that case uh -huh. in general. But uh, there should be the information remnant and also delay as well. Yes, there should be a delay. So these features should remain as it is, but the error increases and we may have another feature. I don't know. I see, I see. Yeah. And the second question is, uh, uh, here you consider a symmetry which only acts on the subspace, uh, each subspace. And uh, can you? And the, the whole step is just one single time step. I I think. The, oh, um, the scrambling yeah, well, and the noise. Yes. And but what if we have a temporal uh, symmetry, uh, symmetry in the time direction? Mm -hmm. Then uh, can you apply this uh, theorem? Well, actually, in this case, uh, we just consider this uh, like uh, uh, this, you know, new radiation comes out uh, from the black hole, right? And in this situation, we can just, you know, apply this uh, unitary step by step in a sense that we first apply this unitary to the n plus k qubits, and then one qubit goes out from the black hole, and the next uh, dynamics happens in the n plus k minus one qubits, and then another uh, qubit goes out. And then the next step is on unitary on n plus k minus two uh, k qubits. And even if we change the situation in this way, uh, we have the same uh, uh, answer, same result. Is this your question? See. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, but that, that highly depends on the noise model, actually. So in this case, the noise is just a partial trace. Mm -hmm. Partial trace is a very simple noise. So that's why we can use some trick. But if the noise is uh, different, uh, for example, depolarizing noise or something, then we cannot use that no um, trick of this step-by-step -step time evolution. Uh, uh, well, uh, is it, is it, uh, I'm not sure, but is this uh, respond to a periodic potential or periodic background? 
periodic bound background. So the, like a, uh, if you have a, a set of uh, a depolarizing uh, noise channel and mm -hmm. uh, also, defa uh, for example, uh, I, I forgot the name, but dephasing. Yeah, dephasing, yes. And if you have a, a, a set of two uh, noise and if you uh, apply this noise channel uh, periodically, so, uh, uh, so alternatively you apply two noises. Yeah, mm -hmm. then uh, it's, it's like a, a periodic background. You're uh, right, yes, yeah. Time direction, we have a periodic mm -hmm. noises. And mm -hmm. in this situation, the, uh, is, that, is that situation corresponds to what you just explained? Um, no, I just said uh, the uh, situation is just, um, the noise is always the same, but it's just repeatingly uh, happening. And between two noises, uh, we have uh, this uh, unitary dynamics. So what, what if uh, uh, there are alternating uh, series of noises? That's a very good question. I don't know. Uh, how can I address it? I think there is a way to address it, but uh, for now, I cannot comment on that. It's a um, very interesting situation. I have never thought of. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know, but it's very interesting. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really interesting. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you very much. So we time is coming, so the next is the last question. ugajin some please. I think he forgot to down his hand. Oh, okay, okay, I see. <laughs> sorry, oh. sorry, yeah, I, oh, okay, I don't okay. have any questions, sorry. Oh, okay, no problem, okay. Okay, time is up. Uh, thank you for the speaker again. Thank you very much. And uh, organizers, can I start the next talk without break time? Or uh, we have to take a break time a few minutes? Maybe a few minutes, maybe. Okay. So, okay, let's start the next talk, uh, 3.20. Oh, sorry, uh, 3.25, 25. Uh, maybe Honda san, maybe you can share your slide. Uh, yeah. Oh, please. Uh, uh, yeah, let me. Yeah. So now now you, you are co-host. Uh, okay, okay. 